If you are someone who is looking for an understanding of what it is that you should be doing at this point in your life, if you are looking for a step-by-step -step guide in how to actualize your dreams and make your life feel like one of ease, where you're moving in alignment with your purpose versus struggling in your day-to-day, you've come to the right place. <laughs> you will be restored, renewed, rejuvenated, revitalized, and all the other R words <laughs> that make you feel good and um, put you on path for purpose. Hey, 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 y'all. Erica Lassan of ericalassan.com here, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Journey to Purpose with me. Ding! <laughs> yeah, I am so excited today for this conversation. You guys don't even know, I have a whole message for you. A whole message that was poured onto my spirit today. And the message is this, restoration is yours. But I'm gonna stop rambling about all the things to come and let's just get into it. <laughs> so you guys know how I do. Usually I like to paraphrase, but then I always end up reading the text anyway. So that's where we're going to start today. We are going to start in 2 Kings verse 8, verses 1 through 6. Ready? Let's go. <laughs> now Elisha had said to the woman whose son had he had restored to life, Go away with your family and stay for a while wherever you can, because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven years. The woman proceeded to do as the man of God said, the man of God being Elisha. She and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines seven years. At the end of the seven years, she came back from the land of the Phil Philistines and went to the king to beg for her house and land. The king was talking to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, being Elisha, and had said, tell me more about all the great things Elisha has done. Just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, the woman whose son Elisha had brought back to life came to beg the king for her house and land. Gehazi said, This is the woman, my lord, the king, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. The king asked the woman about it, and she told him. Then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, Give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. Woo! I don't know if y'all are ready for the fire that was just spoken right here. Like, mm, mm, mm. so I'm just going to read some notes that I jotted down to share with you guys um, about this passage and what's so significant. All right. There are a couple of things to note here. The first being that Elisha has now saved this Shunammite woman like three times. <laughs> it's a little bit of a backstory here is that this Shunammite woman is someone who accepted Elisha into her home out of the goodness of her heart. Like she was a wealthy woman um, and for a really long time she just had Elisha hanging out because she wanted to do good I guess. But in this process the fact that she even had a son was something that the Lord utilized Elisha to give her as a blessing. At one point, he'd been hanging out with the Shunammite woman and her family in her home for some time now. And he thought to himself, what is something nice we can do for this woman? He was speaking to his servant, Gehazi. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but that's what it's written as, Gehazi, maybe. I don't know. But he said, what is something that we can do for her? How can we bless her for blessing us? Um, and just being so gracious towards us. And his servant said to him, well, she doesn't have a son. She doesn't have any children and her husband's old. So it doesn't seem like that's the thing that's gonna be happening anytime soon. And with this, Elisha said, aha, that sounds like a great idea. You know what? The Lord said you're going to have a son about this time next year. And we see in a couple of scriptures after that, that she was blessed with the son. Uh, around the same time that the next year when he came back to visit, he found out that she had this child. And a couple of years later, we find out that the son goes to his father and talks about his head hurting. And then within a couple of hours, he's dead. The boy dies and his mother goes off to see Elisha. And so Elisha is like, you know what? I'm going to send my servant ahead and he's going to place my staff on the boy and the boy will come to life or like he'll be restored. He'll be revived. That didn't happen. 
the woman stayed with Elisha though. And so at some point the servant comes back to Elisha and says, you know what, Lord, he, he's still dead. Um, so Elisha then leaves where he is, which is Mount Carmel and goes back to the Shunammite woman's home. And then he takes his body and lays it over the boy's body. And it says in the scripture that it's, he, he was mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, nose to nose with the boy. So he's basically laying his body out on top of the boy. And after this, he felt the boy's body get warmer. He sneezed seven times and he was brought back to life. After that situation, the woman, uh, the Shunammite woman, is officially like brought into the faith. At this point, she's like, I know that you are a prophet of God. I believe. I am a believer. Whatever it is that you need, you got it. I'm here for you. Thank God. Bless God. Praise God the whole night. So he saved this woman a couple of times. Um, and in this instance, when Elisha told the woman, you need to leave this area because there's about to be a famine for seven years, she was obedient. She didn't ask, ask any questions. She packed up herself and her family and they went to go stay in the land of the Philistines for seven years. Um, the second thing I want to note here is the fact that she was gone for seven years, okay? Why? Because if y'all know me, y'all know I love a, a, a good numerical significance. Seven is the number of completion. Like when you think of the fact that it takes seven days in a week, um, when you think about the fact that it took the Lord seven days to create the earth, and it carries a lot of significance, even as you read um, the scriptures, especially throughout the Old Testament. So the fact that she was away for seven years is like, okay, Lord, you're speaking. The third thing I want to note is the fact that when she came back to her homeland she had plans to beg the king to get her land back but god had other plans okay the fourth thing that i want to note in speaking on this last point is that god is a god of perfect timing okay let's get into it this is the part that gets me so hyped she went back to beg for her land back but it just so happened god is so intentional about his timing that at the time when she came back and this was not planned. Gehazi, Gehazi, we've been through this already. The servant of Elisha was already at the king's palace talking to the king about the miraculous works that Elisha had done at the request of the king. Now, I don't know exactly why Gehazi was there. And at the very time that Elisha's servant was telling the king about the fact that he had brought the dead back to life happened to be the time that this woman showed up to beg back for her land or to beg for her land back like are y'all picking up why i'm so excited about this it is by no coincidence the fifth point that i want to bring up from this passage is the fact that god's works always come with a testimony okay God's work always comes with a testimony. The king didn't know that this woman was going to be showing up. The Gehazi, Gehazi didn't know that this woman was going to be showing up. The woman herself didn't know that the very person who had helped her bring her son back to life, well, not Elisha himself, but the servant of Elisha would be there sharing her testimony. She was able to confirm the very things that he was speaking, not only through her story, but through the showing of the work itself. It says in verse 5, um, Gehazi said, this is the woman, my Lord, the king, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. So her son was present. So not only was it a matter of her speaking about her experience, the king himself was able to visibly see the fruits, <laughs> the manifested fruits of um, Elisha's work, but also faith at work. The point that I want to make with this, and this is kind of what the Lord spoke to me in, in my devotions this morning, is that God's works always come with a testimony, but it comes with a testimony that fortifies faith and understanding in his presence in every and all situations and circumstances, okay? This fortification of faith um, is something that benefits not only the person who is on the receiving end, but it also creates an opportunity to establish and fortify faith in the lives of others okay like when I speak of this experience in particular the woman's faith was fortified because it brought her back to that place and her having to share her testimony it brought her back to that place of remembering how good and how faithful God was in bringing her son back to life everybody else would have said your son is dead let it be leave it alone and because of this very faith that she she 
Seth stood on and in, in calling Elisha so that he could bring her son back to life. Not only was her son brought back to life, but here she is seven, eight, who knows how many years later, at least seven, because we know that that's how long she had been gone. Seven years later or more now testifying of God's acts in her life to the king and sharing her experience. So where he may have just wanted to hear a story about Elisha's work, he was able to hear firsthand about an experience of someone else and how her faith really led to God's faithfulness. So it establishes a, a, an opportunity for faith to be present or understood or known by others. Like us right now who are reading the scripture so many years later. When I talk about the goodness of this word, man, this Bible is full of so many amazing stories and experiences that have happened in the past, but even with it being over 2,000 years old, we know the book is over 2,000 years old, it is still so relevant. The sixth thing that I, I got from this message that I wanna share with you guys is the fact that God restores with abundance, okay? He's not only does he restore with abundance, but he does it with faithful surprises. <sighs> this is the part that gets me so hyped. All right. This is the part that gets me so hyped because not only did the woman receive her land back, the land that she planned on begging for, but she received the money made on it while she was away. It says in the scriptures in verse six, it says, <laughs> that the king then assigned an official to her case and said to him, give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. That's seven years worth of income plus interest, <laughs> plus interest. So not only were her fortunes restored, they were restored in an abundant way. She didn't even have to beg to receive what was already hers. All she had to do was be present and willing to share her story and obey. Oh my gosh. I don't think y'all are hype. I don't think y'all are like picking up what I'm putting down, y'all. She was restored with abundance. All she needed to do was be present. All she needed to do was obey. And all she needed to do was share her testimony, sharing her story. How many of you guys right now are in the same position, whether it is you as an entrepreneur, whether it is you as someone who is um, just in a position where you're going through a life shift right now or a change or a transformation and you don't know exactly how to move in it or what it is that you're supposed to do. Like you, you don't really have to do anything. You just have to be willing to show up and be present. You have to be willing to sit still and obey the instructions that are given to you and you may be like what are instructions i don't hear anything no one has told me to do anything let me tell you something the instructions are always being given to you the question is are you sitting still long enough to actually listen and receive them okay that's a conversation for another day but at the same time as you're getting this, these instructions the third piece that you need to understand is that there is value in sharing your story, especially the hard times, all right? She had a whole son that was dead at one point. In the moment, I'm sure she was like, not panicking, obviously, because she did what was needed in going to see Elisha so that her son could be revived. But how many of you are sharing your hard times? Because you need to understand that as you get through your hard times, the testimony that you have is not meant for you to sit on and harbor and be stingy with. It's meant for you to share because in doing that, you then actually help others in getting through hard times of their own. But then you're also able to um, be brought to that place of, of understanding how you were brought out of a situation or a circumstance by faith. And that reignites your faith. That reestablishes your faith in moments where you may... Um, be finding it hard to uh, proceed with what your mission, your life's calling, your purpose, your joy, and all those other things are. This, this scripture also made me think about God's promise of the blessing of the promised land that he gave his children, the children of Israel, in Deuteronomy 6.11. I'm really talking about this, the promise of um, abundance and being restored. And when I think about restoration, I think of Jesus for a number of reasons, but 
I'm going to read this scripture for you guys from Deuteronomy 6.11. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers to Abraham Isaac and Jacob to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide wells you did not dig and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant then when you eat and are satisfied be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery <laughs> yeah are you guys hearing this and this i think is moses that was speaking at the time right yes at this point now the children of israel had been walking around for 40 years um as a punishment for them not really stepping into the blessing that god had given them uh as his children when he said you know what leave Egypt. I'm going to take you from the land of Egypt where you were slaves for over 400 years. And I'm going to give you the land that I'd promised your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a prophecy. This is a promise that had been given to them for like a bunch of generations. At this time, it was time for them to walk into their blessing. But rather than accepting the blessing that had been given to them, rather than walking by faith into the promise that God had given them and been giving them for years, for centuries, at the time when it was time for them to go in, they, they, they succumbed to fear. They succumbed to their fears. They did not walk into their blessing, but instead... They thought of all the things that could go wrong instead of thinking about all of the things that could go right. <sighs> Moses had sent 12 people into this land, the promised land, to scout out the land. And this wasn't even something, when you read the scriptures um, a couple of times, you realize that this wasn't even something that God called them to do. This was something that Moses did on his own. So like that's a whole conversation for a whole other day because the Lord had given them the land. There was no need for them to go and explore it to see what God had given them. Like God had already stated that it was good. But at the same time, while they came back with the message of how good this land was, they also came back with like messages of fear, fear that they were never supposed to receive to begin with. OK, and of the 12 people, only two people told them only two people rested in the promise of God saying we should still go try to get this land. Like, y'all, God has promised this land to us. We can take this. Gosh, I'm doing it again. I am paraphrasing. I'm just going to read the scripture. We can be so foolish sometimes as humans, just like not leaning on the promises of things that have already been done. And all the promises are outlined right here in the good book in the Bible. If only we would just believe it <laughs> by faith. Anyway, let me just read what these people did. So it says, when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob. But it says in verse 23, when they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. All right. Now in verse 26 it says, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses the account, this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it, flow, it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. 
those were the giants. Um, the Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, um, come from the Nephilim, which were the giants. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Y'all, they just talked themselves out of a blessing. <laughs> they just explored them their way out of an entire blessing and prophecy of a blessing and a gift of a promised land that had been prophesied for over 400 years. This had been promised to them for over 400 years, and it only took 40 days for them to... <laughs> to talk themselves out of the very blessing of land that had been given to them, promised to them. 40 days was all it took. And they saw that the land was exactly what God had always promised. They stated, yes, it does indeed flow with milk and honey. There's so much goodness there, but there are all these big people that live there, but it is fortified, but the people are huge and we're like grasshoppers compared to them. <laughs> and then in, in chapter 14, it then begins to talk about how the people wanted to rebel against Moses and God himself. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They were living in fear of what was in front of them rather than by faith of what had been promised to them, foretold to them, prophesied towards them. Um, and what was, had been stated is already theirs. And because of this, they were, they were willing to go back to being slaves to the people who had held them in captivity for over 400 years. And it says that they, they talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? <sighs> yeah, the opposite of believing in the very things that God says of you and has promised to you is contempt. It's not even like di simply disbelief or simply a lack of trust. It's contempt. That's what it says here. How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all of the miraculous signs I performed among them? You not believing in the very gifts that God has given you, you not believing in your purpose enough to pursue it is something that will not only keep you from living the life that you've been meant to live, an abundant life, a prosperous life, prosperous life a joy-filled life, a life that's full of good things, a life that bears good fruit. Living misaligned from your purpose will keep you from those very things. But not only that, it will keep you bound by fear. It will keep you bound by fear. The punishment for the Israelites not listening to God's promises and really just going against the report that was given to them by Joshua and Caleb was the fact that they had to roam the desert for 40 years, one year for each day <laughs> of the exploration. And it was their children that entered the promised land. None of them got to taste the fruit. All of the stories that they'd heard, all of the, about their promise, the promised land and what it meant for them and how they would be able to experience it one day, they were not able to live in it. They weren't able to experience any of it because of their lack of faith, their lack of trust in the very promises that God had given them. And my point here is this, this is the seventh thing that I got from this scripture, this passage, now going back to 2 Kings, that God is just waiting for you to believe. <laughs> he's waiting for you to believe in yourself, but more importantly, he's waiting for you to believe in what has been deposited in you, what is currently present, the joy that is meant to be soaked up and relished in right now, even if you're going through a hard time. All right, you simply need to believe. There is evidence of his goodness all around. There, like when you look back over your life and some of the things that you may have gone through and how you were able to make it out on the other side, or if you think of hard situations or circumstances that you may have had at one point, 
and things that you're currently believing for that may seem like they are not happening or never going to happen. Understand that that is not true. That's not your portion. Everything you desire is already yours. Everything you need to make those very things happen, you already have access to. You just need to be present. Obey your instructions. Share your testimony and live in alignment with your purpose. You just simply have to live joyfully. Live joyfully. In this very moment, God is waiting for you to glorify Him. God is waiting for you to thank Him. God is waiting for you to understand that you have been blessed with immeasurably more than you could even begin to ask or imagine. And that's just not me being original. That's from Ephesians 3.20. But everything you desire, you already have access to. Whether it be that promotion, whether it be your business taking off, whether it be your family coming together, whether it be restoring a relationship, whether it be your spouse, your, you finding your significant other, your wife, your husband, whether it be you starting a family, whatever it is that you're looking for, keep moving forward in trust, obey the steps given to you, and in faith, share your story. You will be restored. You will be restored. The Shunammite woman was restored I want to say seven times over. I don't know how many times. We don't know how much money she was making on her land. But not only did she get her land back without having to beg, she got all that money. She was not expecting that blessing. She was not expecting that blessing. She thought, I'm going back from our land back and at least I'll have some place to live. The Lord was like, oh no, you will not only come back, you will come back restored and with more wealth than when you left. You will come back better than when you left. Oof, that is my prayer for all of you guys. Dang, man, I've spoken so much about this. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get to Acts. The second passage that I wanted to share with you guys was from Acts. Acts 16, uh, verses 16 through 39. Do you think I can do it quickly? I'm going to try. I'm going to run down real quick the notes that I have about this passage and what was dropped on my spirit. Really quick. We can do this in five minutes, right? We can do it. We can do it. All right, here we go. <laughs> Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw, he was sleeping on the job, he shouldn't have been sleeping on the job. <laughs> the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he had thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. Mm. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell, trembling before Paul and Silas. In verse 30 it says, He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. Mm. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. 
The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and then threw us into prison. And now you want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them out of the prison, requesting that they leave the city. <gasps> Y'all, I want to go in, but I'm not going to go in. I'm just going to read these points real quick because the main part of what I want to share with you guys, I've already spoken on. The main point being this, Paul and Silas were restored. The second thing to note here is that Paul and Silas were both stripped, flogged, beaten, and thrown in prison. Yet even then, in their moment of struggle and hardship and um, humiliation, they were able to praise and pray and ultimately anchor themselves in their joy. And this praise produced a result. The result being an earthquake that literally shook the foundations of the prison itself and knocked their shackles off. Technically, it created an opportunity for freedom. And when I talk about freedom here, I want you guys to understand there are two ways to see this freedom that their praise was able to produce. They were able to literally walk out the jail if they wanted to. And this is my third point here. They were literally able to walk out of the jail. Their chains had been broken. They were free. I mean, they were technically always free in Christ, but they were, they were free free, okay? They could have walked out of the jail, but they stayed and did their job. Their job being to minister and spread the gospel and share the good news. And they did this to the jailer. Paul saw that the jailer was about to kill himself. He said, hold up. Hold up, don't harm yourself, we're all still here. And in that very moment, rather than running to their freedom, they, they ministered and said, and they brought freedom to the jailer and his family. Oh my God. They brought freedom to the jailer and his family. That's my fourth point. <laughs> <laughs> they were able to deliver the jailer and his family into freedom um, and telling them what they needed to do to believe. And then it says that after Paul and Silas had baptized the jailer and his family, the jailer did his job now and took them back to jail. All right. He had cleaned them up. He had fed them, given them a meal and all that stuff. Um, but at the same time, he still had a job to do. So he took them back to the jail and put them back in cuffs. And in the morning, it says that in Acts uh, 16, 35, that Paul and Silas were set to be released. But Paul, being emboldened by the power of the Holy Spirit, wanted a bold restoration. OK, and a bold restoration he received. This is my sixth point. Paul didn't quietly leave the way the magistrates and all of them wanted him to. He didn't leave quietly, but instead he demanded not only an apology, but he wanted a public apology. All right. This restored them. This restored Paul and Silas. And it was through that they found through that that they discovered that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens to begin with. So technically, like this shouldn't have happened to them, but they were restored abundantly publicly <sighs> y'all man this word that i want to by the way that's all i got for you guys this word is so so good that brings me to the end of this week's episode and if there's anything that i have to leave with you guys today it's this again be still <laughs> Be still. If you are someone who is looking for direction and what it is that you should be doing with your life, how to get through a hard time, and you feel like it's not going to happen for you or you're just tired of trusting and waiting, have patience, okay? If you are doing something purposefully, if you feel as though this is something you've been called to do, that something that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has placed on your heart, keep pushing through. Ground yourself in what you're doing. Trust that everything that you desire and everything that you wish to do will actually come to pass. You're on the right track. You just gotta keep pushing, okay? At the same time, be willing to obey. We learned that from the Shunammite woman. She left when she was told to left or else she would have died of famine, all right? But not only that, when she felt a need to go back and ask for her land, she went back. 
you know, move in alignment with your purpose. Same thing with Paul and Silas. Like they knew what their mission was. So everywhere they went, they, they held on to what it is that they knew they should be doing. Even in an opportunity where they could have escaped a prison and run for freedom, they didn't receive a message to do that. So they stayed where they were. And that led to an opportunity for other people to be led to freedom in Christ. So be willing to obey. The signs are always there. The signals are always pointing you in the right direction. You just got to listen to them. And the last thing is to make sure that you are sharing your story. Okay? Opportunities for you to share your testimony are constantly presenting themselves. If you're an entrepreneur, it's probably a part of the reason why you started your business. The story of your life is simply a daily testimony that you're living. Your life is a living testimony of God's goodness. And even though you may be going through a hard time right now, understand that in doing all of these things, restoration is yours. If you are going through a hard time where you feel like there is no point, or you feel like it's the end, or you are feeling downtrodden to the point of no return, understand your restoration is on the way. Believe it and receive it. Oh man, I'm thirsty. My mouth is dry. I'm gonna go inside and get a swig of some agua, some agua fresca, some fresh water. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I hope that you guys enjoyed this message and that it was enriching to you in some way. Um, if you found this message beneficial, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Subscribe to this channel, subscribe to this podcast, share it with a friend who may need the message as well. And if you are someone that is in need of some tips, tricks, and strategies to get yourself aligned with your own joy or discovering your purpose, please join you to purpose with me. Visit my site, ericalassan.com, and there you will find all the tips, tricks, resources that are necessary to help you rediscover, reconnect, and recommit to your purpose and identity and joy one feel good thing at a time. I look forward to journeying with you and I look forward to seeing you guys next week. I have loved chatting with you and I hope that you guys take this message and that you run with it and live out your wildest dreams today and always. Until later, bye, one feel good thing at a time.